health care, um, actually universal health care, uh, national insurance were first proposed by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. So over 100 years ago, presidents started saying, and way, way, way back when, and it's really interesting, but I thought we wouldn't start more than 100 years back. Then Theodore Rose, then uh, Franklin Roosevelt in 1935, and um, President Truman included it in part of his 1945 fair deal, and he tried twice very hard to do that, to do the uh, universal health care. And then finally, in 1965, President Johnson was able to sign with um, Harry Truman's uh, backing and finally bipartisan support that Medicare and Medicaid. Now back then, Medicare and Medicaid were supposed to be the beginning of healthcare for everybody. It was going to start and then continue and everybody was gonna get healthcare and it would just go from seniors and keep, keep moving along. Well, we know what happened there. While all the other countries in the world were already giving health care for everybody, but at that time, the United States chose a different route. Then uh, increments, I think um, hospice was in the 1980s, they had that. But all the way up into 2003, finally, John Conyers introduced, improved, and expanded Medicare for All Act. And it was called HR 676 back then, and it was originally crafted by physicians. Physicians who were tired of their insurance company <coughs> telling them how much time they could spend with a patient and what treatment to give. And then 2010, the Affordable Care Act was, was passed. And it did a lot of really good things. People benefit, uh, pre-existing conditions were covered, Medicaid and Medicaid subsidies were expanded. And when Congress tried to eliminate it, the citizens pushed back and said, don't take that, we want these. And it showed up in the 2018 midterm elections when uh, the people ran on universal health care and they won. Everybody's ready for universal health care. Now is the time, after over 100 years of trying, now is the time. People are really hurting so bad, they realize they've really got to start, stand up and fight if they want universal health care. So our current situation, I think many of you probably have experienced it in many different ways, but when Carol and I first wrote this um, um, slideshow, we just said our health care system was dysfunctional. And then a couple of months after that, you know, it's broken. And just this week, we said, you know what? This is a crisis. And, and we both came to realize it because both of us were having personal experiences now in our own families. You can read all about this. You can passionately advocate for it. But until it happens to you, all of a sudden, I go, this is, this is real somehow. I don't know why I didn't. I was passionate about it before, and now I guess I'm even more passionate about it. My, I had to fly to Florida the day after Christmas because my sister had been rushed to the hospital and was going to have emergency surgery. And I stayed with her for two weeks. And through those two weeks, I really learned a lot about our system. So our healthcare system, we know it's expensive, and we know it's inefficient. It's very complicated. It's actually unsustainable, the growth of healthcare costs. And it's not working for many of us. I just wanted to show you this uh, graph. Not as to say anything between Canada and USA or anything like that. What I wanted to show it to you was for, was because you can see that they're spending 11% on their GDP and we're at almost 19%. And you can see how it's gone skyrocketing in the United States and in Canada's state. Well, I do have to add, though, in, met, in the studies that Carol and I have studied, when they study the 19 wealthiest countries, industrialized, developed countries, 18 of them follow that Canadian line very close, and then the United States flies to the top. We're the 19th out of 18. And I just wanted to show you this graph because it shows you those 18 other countries and it shows that we're paying $10,209 per person every year 
for health care insurance. That's when you divide our government 6.65 trillion by our population, you get $10,209. The average, okay, so we have New Zealand down here, and Finland and United Kingdom, and then you go all the way up to Switzerland. But the average of those is 5,221. So they're all doing it. They're all giving health care to everybody. And they're doing it at half of what we're doing. Oh, and I also want to mention that uh, along on some of the slides you'll see OECD or a Commonwealth Fund or World Health Organization. And I have, if anybody wants this, um, presentation with all the notes that go along with it. I'll be happy to give it to you and it shows you all of the resources that we've studied uh, to come up with the facts, not the myths. We have massive billing operations, millions of healthcare dollars not going for healthcare, providers overwhelmed with insurance related administration paperwork. I'm sure you've seen that when you go into the doctor's office and there's a whole staff of people running around doing other things, like administration and paperwork. Thousands of policies and codes, claim denials, continually having to solicit and renegotiate payments. There was just an article that came out today, and in that article, it was talking about how many different codes there are. Cleveland Clinic, you know, you have to have the right code to get paid with your insurance company and all that. There's 210 million different codes that Cleveland Clinic uses. Oh, 2.7 million people are uninsured and 87 million are uninsured. And I wanted to tell you real quick, my, my story, what first started me um, learning about this was because in 2017, um, I got a letter from Cigna my insurance company, and I've had insurance since I've been 20, paying for it, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and uh, I never was without my insurance. Never went to the hospital, went to my doctor once a year, but never used my insurance. I got a letter from Cygnus saying, starting January 1st, 2018, my, my, my husband's policy would be $2,500 a month. That's $30,000 a year, plus $7,500 7, in deductible. So before we could even start using our insurance, we were over 40,000. So I became one of the underinsured for the first time in my life because I had to cancel our policy. And 87 million, you might not be able to relate to that, but for ages between 19 and 64, that's 45% of our population. When they say underinsured, that means you have insurance, but it's not adequate. And so you're gonna to have to pay, uh, you may not, not go to the doctor because you got the deductible, so you can't afford it. So you have insurance, catastrophic insurance, but it may not cover everything that you need. My son has insurance, he's self-employed. He pays $1,200 a month and has $7,500 deductible. It only covers catastrophic things. So yes, he has insurance, but only, not for uh, the, the average thing that you need insurance for. So when you see it underinsured, it means inadequately insured. Thanks, girl. And then people are going bankrupt or dying because they cannot afford insurance or care. And that could be a whole day on that one. <laughs> There's so many people, thousands and thousands of people that go bankrupt. So in the, um, the Washington Post, there was a story this week about a woman who was a CB, CBS investigative reporter. She was sick, got sicker and sicker. She decided it was in her appendix, so she went to the emergency room. So as she, uh, they did the test and they said they have to have immediate surgery or else, you know, you can, septus can sit in, you can die. And then the doctor said, and she, she made sure that the insurance was in her network, or that, excuse me, the hospital was in her network. However, the doctor wasn't. So here she is being rushed off to surgery, and she's having to decide whether or not she's gonna have the, the surgery there. So the doctor said, you know, what kind of living do you make and what do you do and this kind of stuff? And he said, well, it's gonna cost $17,000. So the what are you gonna do? You're going for the surgery. 
So she tried to fight that, um, and she found that the average cost for anybody that didn't have insurance for that particular operation was under $3,000. But he was charging $17,000 because he doesn't work for the hospital. He can charge whatever he wants to charge. And so you gotta be uh, very careful today. When you go in, you need to make sure that the hospital that you're going to or the doctor carries is in your network. If, it's, if he's not in your network, the insurance company is not gonna pay for that. And today, one out of five, the statistics are that just came out this week, that one out of five people, when they go to the hospital, an in-network hospital, the doc, um, they are served by a doctor that's not in network. So you gotta, you know, as you're going to the emergency room, call and find out, <laughs> go to a different hospital, or it can cost you thousands of dollars. And on that same thing, my experience with my sister was she went to the hospital for emergency surgery, it was in network, but just before I left, she got bills for $40,000 she had blood work done while she was there for blood work. The blood work lab was out of network. So Big Pharma, I thought maybe we could let it, you know, make it a little bit. Your money or your life, he says, and he's handling, handing her her pills. <laughs> so the U.S. overpays for prescriptions, like. $21 in 1976 and 275 and 200. So you got this much in 1996 and this little bit here in 2017. So here's one of our first myths. It says we pay high insurance premiums because we have the best healthcare system in the world. And I used to believe that. How many of us, does anybody still believe that? Of those countries I was telling you about, um, here's another study that's done by the Commonwealth Fund. They scored on care and access, administrative efficiency, equity, and health outcomes. We're down here on the bottom. UK, Australia, Netherlands are up at the top. 11 country average, here we've got Switzerland, Sweden, Germany in the middle, Canadian, France. And when you, step, when you do these, when you research these studies, sometimes France will be at the top, and sometimes UK will be in the middle, and sometimes Canada. They're, they're all different, but we consistently are at the bottom. And so we have um, health outcomes that are significantly worse as well. I know you've heard about the maternal death rate is increasing here, so those other countries, their maternal death rates are staying the same or going down, and the U.S. is going up. And then African-American women are more than twice as likely to die than their white counterparts. But, look at this one. Low life expectancy. In the 60s, the United States lived longer than anybody else in the world. Today, it's gone down to 78.8. Here we go, so all the way up to Switzerland at 83. So what's really a shame is that GoFundMe medical campaigns are a strong sign that our healthcare system is not working. And according to the CEO of the company, people are raising 650 million each year. So can you imagine being sick and worried, maybe you've got cancer, your family's worried about you, but you've got to think about going on and setting up and going, begging people on the internet for money. Life and Debt Stories from Inside America's GoFundMe healthcare system. And then there's a CEO. One third, one third of the site's donations are to cover medical costs. And then I hadn't thought about this one before, but Charlie Munger, he's the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, he's, he explains how it's bad for our country as well because businesses can't compete when they're paying high costs of healthcare for their people and none of the other countries that they're competing with are. So they have a hard time um, giving increases, new technology, keeping their prices um, competitive. Here's an example from um, a small company, a mid-sized company. So he gave us an example and he broke it down that of his 200 employees that are like family to him, they're an um, international market leader, and 
he pays 2.7 million to cover their health care insurance. He doesn't mind covering health care insurance, but within the last 10 years, it's gone so high, it's almost pushed them out of business. He's had to um, take cuts himself. His people have had to take cuts. They sit down for months before the end of the year to try and figure out how they're going to pay medical and who's going to, what's going to happen with their paychecks and their deductibles going up. So it's $27,000 a year for a family. And the study just came out the other day. Carolyn and I are updating this almost daily. It is now up to $28,000 a year in the United States. Um, and $14. It's $13.50 an hour per employee just for the insurance, and 22% of this payroll. So again, it flattens wages, it deters hiring, and it weakens competitiveness in the marketplace. So that's what it's doing to the companies. So what's our possible solutions being advocated? And this is where um, we've heard so much now about all the different plans that everybody is proposing, all the different debates, and everybody's talking about something different. Uh, one of them is to strengthen and fix the Affordable Care Act. Expand Medicare and Medicaid eligibility, and part of that is that buy-in that people say. Develop a public option, leave it to the states, and then a single-payer way of doing things. So if one of the things that um, Carol and I have been really trying to say lately is, and a lot of people have been changing their stand on a lot of where they, what they want to propose. So keeping up with that, but number one through four have a lot in common. So we thought instead of just spreading them all out and going, oh gee, that one's like that one. They all have administration costs due to complicated the inefficient multiplayer system with dozens of insurance companies and thousands of policies. So the first four are all connected to insurance companies. Thus there will be no financial savings while adding the expense of covering more people. So a lot of these other, all the other four, they're saying, well, let's, let's expand this, let's buy in that, let's have a public option, but they're all adding more people while adding expense. And no savings. And, and no savings. So that's the that's another thing that ties them together. You can't balance off. You're adding more expense, but you're not saving anywhere. And then, of course, many people are still left under, uninsured and underinsured, according to all the studies that have been done on um, trying to do these first four. And such tinkering around the edges does not solve the problem of a dysfunctional system based on profits. And this tinkering around the edges is where we've been talking about since 1965 when everybody was supposed to be added. Just the incremental steps that are been trying to take haven't worked because all the incremental steps just add another layer of expense and administration and cost. So what would we like? We would like to have universal health care for, for everybody. Something that covers everybody's needs. So you don't have to worry about going into emergency care. You can get your primary care, mental health, addiction treatment, prescription drugs, instead of having the pharmacist you know, holding it up saying your life or your medical devices, dental, vision, long-term care, both home-based and institutionally based. We'd like freedom and flexibility. We want patients to be able to choose their doctors with no networks. When my sister went into the hospital, she shouldn't have had to worry about thinking, are, are my doctors going to be in networkers? The lab is the Efficiency in your negotiation with those. So it slashes the bureaucracy. Administrative paperwork negotiates prescriptions, drug prices, and services. And eliminates premiums, co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance, and surprise bills, like lab bills for $40,000. And health services remain pri private. So here's the thing. 
it means the doctors are going to have their own businesses, the hospitals will have their own businesses, but there'll be a single payer in a universal. There'll be a single payer. One payer, the bills get sent to that payer, and they pay the bills with nobody in between saying, you can't do that. And then improved Medicare for all is simple. Okay, so single payer, like I was saying, it's one entity is responsible for paying our bills. Important medical decisions are left to the healthcare provider and the patient. Nobody else. What we have now is what they call a multiplayer system, where it's chaotic. It's filled with bureaucracy and efficiency and ways things going this way and employers and insurance companies and everything's going that way. And this little boy is saying single payer, individual's medical expense. Boop, done. And it's really interesting too, you look at some of the videos about how Canada does their, their single payer, and there's an administrative person and she's sitting there typing in what uh, the information for the person that the doctor just saw, and they have a little clock above her. And she types it all in and hits send, and that's all she does, and the bill is paid two weeks later. And it was 13 seconds on the clock when it stopped. In comparison, in comparison, a multi-payer means, you know, right now we have thousands of policies. And when you go to the doctor's office, you see all the staff that's there because they have to find the right code. They have to apply, they have to apply for it. Then they get denied and then you have to reapply and then you actually get it okay and then they have to try to get their money. So it's an ongoing thing and that statistics are today in the hospital. For every patient in a hospital, they have a person working in the office to handle their insurance. So when you say, well, how are we ever going to pay for it? Right there, you're gonna cut that staff because you're not gonna to have to have one person per patient in the hospital doing all that billing and fighting the insurance companies all the time. So the one payer means you send it to one entity, which is a government agency, and they pay back. That's what Medicare now is. We've already got that program in place. We're not reinventing the wheel. It's already there. Who benefits under single payer Medicare for all? Well, everyone does. So union workers, everyone with employer-based insurance, Medicare recipients, employers, those inadequately insured, those who have no health insurance, the sick, the healthy, the old, the young, and those in between. So everyone is, is, uh, is helped. So right now, people have their insurance policies and they're going, I don't want to lose my insurance policy. Or they're using the argument that unions, unions don't want to lose that. They negotiated for that. Well, right now, Medicare for All covers everything. So if you're on Medicare and you lose your policy, oh well, you're getting something better than you already have. And unions, every time you have a union contract, you have to renegotiate. And when you're renegotiating, then you're renegotiating for your health insurance and a raise. And when the employer is having to pay all that money out for your health insurance, then they're not giving you raises. They can't afford to do both. So unions are going to have to renegotiate that health care policy because they're going to be covered. You don't have to worry about if you change jobs or if you want to start your own business or you want to, or if you get sick. Right now, if you get sick and you lose your job and your job was the one that provided the insurance, you're losing your job. Not not only your job, you're losing your health insurance. So some of the questions being asked, I have insurance through my employer, why would I want to change? Just because you have great coverage today does not mean you're going to have it next year. And I think, Carol, don't you have a story about your husband? So my husband was uh, worked for GM, who was a senior engineer for 38 years. When he retired, he had a contract that we would have health insurance for both of our lives till we both died. A signed contract. However, when GM went, uh, was having financial problems, what happened? The senior, uh, the salaried people all lost their insurance. So did the hourly workers, but they hired a lawyer and got some of that back. But just because you think right now 
you have insurance through your, pro, your employer doesn't mean that down the road that you're still gonna have that insurance. We are an example of that. We lost that insurance. So I had retired from the county and when I retired, I was working part-time at that time. So I went back to find out if I could get insurance, which I was able to do, but because I retired working part-time, I had to pay half the premiums. Of course, that's $426, which is nothing today for insurance, but we were tickled as we could be. So we still had excellent insurance. However, uh, I went home this summer and I worked for the county. Well, the county, the taxes aren't coming in like they used to, and the health insurance has gone sky high. And, and when you work for the county, there's mandated services that the county has to provide. So they're kind of in a rough place. They don't have the money. So we're saying, but we had a signed contract that we should have health insurance. And they're going, yeah, but there's no money there. So something's got to give. So we are now, we've had to hire two lawyers to fight for us to keep our health benefits in retirement. So when you hear these arguments, well, I have the greatest insurance and I don't want to lose it. You may have it right now, but that doesn't mean tomorrow that you're still going to have that. So, um, every year employers must research plans to try and find the best ones to meet their budgets and employee needs, and every year that gets harder and harder and harder as the insurance rates go up. They have little control over what the insurance companies charge. They just have to figure out, usually raising their deductibles and making all kinds of um, concessions <laughs> with their employees. Uh, employees making concessions. History shows that each year plans can change, and premiums can go up, which they have. And eventually employers have to pass those higher premiums on to their employees and retirees, including higher deductibles and co-pays. It may also affect the level of health care coverage offered and then like Carol's story with her husband and herself. With single payer Medicare for all, you don't have to worry about your employer taking away or changing your insurance during union negotiations. You have guaranteed health care for life so that if you want to, like Carol was saying, if you want to quit and, and become an entrepreneur and start a new business, or um, if you lose your job, you don't lose your insurance as well. With Medicare for all, you always have insurance you don't have the premiums, you can, um, it's freedom. It's just basically being very, very free. To have the choice to do what you want to do. And Medicare for All takes away your choice. And that's, that Medicare for All actually gives you choice. Um, okay, so if you're eligible for Medicare, and let's say you choose an Advantage plan, okay? Those are administered by for-profit insurance companies. So they too change yearly. They have various options, which range of coverage premiums, their co-payments and their deductibles. It's an insurance company, so they have the same thing. They come with restrictive networks and providers, which Carol can attest to as well. So I'm one of those that has the Advantage program. Does anybody else have an Advantage? And so there's some real benefits to the Advantage program, but there's some very major disadvantages it's only in your county. So like in Maricopa County, you have nine different insurance companies with 41 different plans. However, any Advantage program is only good in the county where you buy it. So I live half the year in Michigan and half the year in Arizona. So my plan is Michigan-based. So I'm great if I get sick in Michigan, but if I get sick out here, I gotta hope that I'm really sick because it'll cover me if I'm in a car accident or have a heart attack or something. But if you have something else, it doesn't cover it. So when you see all these ads on TV and how wonderful it is and what it's covering, um, if you go, if you're out of network or you're out of state, then you got major problems. So our health insurance, when we're in Arizona, is we pray a lot that we don't get sick. Mm -hmm. Thirty-four percent of the premiums go to admin, so um, that's where one of the costs savings is because Medicare, well, I'll go to the next one, Medicare for all, it's administered by one government agency, just like Medicare is. 
Uh, it's stable, everyone is covered from birth until death for all essential health needs, and there's no co-pays, supplemental plans, surprise medical bills or networks. And you have the freedom to choose your healthcare providers and hospitals. But here's what I wanted to tell you. 3% of the healthcare money goes for admin. So this is where um, you were asking about the, some of the savings. Instead of having 34% of your healthcare dollar going for administration, when Medicare for All, this amazing system that they have already in place since 1965, they've got it down to 3% is admin. Let me say one other thing about at the Advantage programs. Uh, a lot of people, well, I just, I live in one place, so it doesn't matter to me. My husband had major heart problems, and the local doctor said it's above what I can do. So we chose to go to Cleveland Clinic, number one in heart issues. I spent the whole summer trying to set that up. You gotta have codes, and every time you call the insurance company, you talk to a different person, and that person gives you different information. So I spent all summer, finally got the codes, got out the appointments set up, we drove from Michigan to Cleveland Clinic, stayed overnight in the hotel, had everything ready, and they call me from clinic, Cleveland Clinic and they say, the insurance company has not okayed your procedure. And it was like, I talked to so-and-so, and this is what, I've got names, I've got numbers, I've got everything. Well, I'm sorry, it's not okay. So we had the decision, after you spend all summer getting an appointment and actually getting there, do you do it? So I had to sign papers that if the insurance company would not come through, I would have to pay for that, which was thousands and thousands of dollars. So come to find out, uh, within the insurance company itself, they didn't know that there was a different department for out-of-network. So even the insurance companies are not uh, well-educated on what they do in their own thing. So luckily, we were able to, the insurance company finally paid for it. But my husband wasn't well enough to do that. Had I not been there, had I not been smart enough, had I not had the tenacity, number one, he never would have got in, and number two, we would have ended up paying for it had he gotten in. So these horror stories are all over. I would be surprised if you don't know somebody that's had a problem, because everybody that we talk to comes up and tells us about their horror stories, and it's happening more and more all the time. So choice, who makes it? If your insurance company is provided by your employer. And we're going through a lot of these because there's so many so many people that ask us questions about what if I have employer insurance? And if you have an employer-based plan, your employer chooses your health plan, your insurance chooses your healthcare network, your insurer chooses what prescriptions and treatment and procedures you will get covered, and your insurer chooses your doctors. Now, with Medicare for All, this single payer, it's real simple. You're free to choose your healthcare provider and hospital. Everything's covered, across the state lines, no networks. It's so simple. So how can we possibly transition from our current system to a single payer system? It seems impossible. And I think that's one of the other myths that they're trying to scare everybody with. It's too hard, it's too hard. But Medicare, when it went in in 1965, was fully functional within a year without computers. Everybody was signed up. Everybody was ready to go within a year. And there are two bills. I mean, this has been worked on, obviously, like we said, for a very long time. There's a lot of bills in Congress right now, but there's two in particular. Um, that have it spelled out down to the minute detail. Um, the payment pro and provider structures already exist within the Medicare program to prevent a tr transition to a single payer healthcare system. And what they, um, when this first started, they were just calling it single payer. But because people didn't understand what single payer meant, they decided that they would call it. Medicare, because everybody understands that Medicare is, a, is it's the favorite program. So, because Medicare is a single payer program. But we can't get confused, it's not Medicare like it is today. It would be the Medicare infrastructure with added and improved and enhanced. A 
Okay, well, here's, this is when there are a lot of people there said, what happens to all those healthcare workers if something, if uh, we had a single payer system? Okay, and both bills allocate money for the first five years to assist displaced workers in every way conceivable possible you can dream of. And then the providers can actually return to caring for their patients like they wanted to all along when they were writing the bill. How do we pay for it? This is one of, the, one of uh, everybody wants to know. Okay, that all sounds really great, Linda, but how do we pay for it? But see, we're already paying for it. You remember that $10,229? We're already paying for it. How do we pay for it? Okay, well, $600 billion in savings to start because we could negotiate prices on drugs, medical equipment, and services. They actually passed a law in the early 1990s that um, you couldn't negotiate with pharmaceutical companies on drugs. That's why that um, graph line started spiking. Of course, lower administration costs, we saw that. Only one agency is processing and paying. There's just one place, there's all the chaos is, is removed. And profit is eliminated. That's another, that's another uh, couple billion. I love this graph because it kind of shows you that, look right here, we already have a single payer system in this country. Two thirds of our country is already single payer. It's Medicare, Medicaid, the ACA, subsidies, TRICARE, veterans, CHIP, IHS, and federal employees are all paid by that single payer. On this other side, we have premiums, co-pays, deductibles, and insurance. That's the rest of us over here. So what they would do if they had improved Medicare for all is they'd use the existing public funding, the way it's all been done now, but they'll have new public dollars from payroll and other tax. Meaning that right now your insurance company or your employers are paying an insurance company. Mm -hmm. Instead of paying an insurance company, they would be going into this fund of money, this pot of money. Mm -hmm. And several different people have several different ways of doing the taxes. Some people say they'll tax uh, higher income. Some people uh, say that they'll have um, taxes on certain um, stock trade. You know, they've got, they've got so many different ways that they could uh, make money. That replaces what you're already paying for private insurance. So 95% of the people will pay less for health care than they do now. So, and I'm, no, I won't even say that. I was, I was going to say if I was paying $30,000 a year for my health care and my taxes went up $10,000 and I had everything covered, so that's just my Right now, question. the for profit for the insurance companies, this year they're on, um, to, what is it? I'm trying to make $200 billion in profit. You know, that's after they pay for the CEOs and all the workers and all those Seattle's ads you see on TV, all the lobbying, all the billions of dollars that they're spending on lobbying. This money, this $200 billion that they're making in profits, that can go to health insurance. Now go to health care. Healthcare. So why haven't we heard about this? And, and this, is, this is very important because this will probably answer a lot of questions. There's an alliance called um, Partnership for America's Healthcare Future. Doesn't that sound really good? But it's actually a dark money group that was put together just in 2018 when they realized that there's just a lot of angry people out there that want single payer and that they're working hard and that they're starting to say, no, we want this. We don't want the insurance companies to be making so much money. So. They're pooling their money. It's all the insurance companies, hospitals, um, pharma, everybody. They might fight among each other, but they're pulling together for this. They're putting together all their tens of millions of dollars, and they're waging a war of scare tactics. You've seen the ads on TV. And it's all about, they're calling it FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And they're very open about it. That's what they're doing. 
what their strategy is, is they want to give centrists, um, they, they want to give them talking points that divide people. Haven't we seen that all the time? They're all, all the ads are dividing people. Uh, they hide the agenda designed to enrich powerful corporations. Utilize the media to, to spread disinformation because you know so much of the media can't afford their uh, in-depth reporters like they used to. So they rely on um, people that come and say, "Here, this is what's happening. This is what's this is what's going on," and then that's that's what they can report on. Um, there's two lobbyists for every congressperson from pharma, two lobbyists uh, in, for every congressperson. Unaffordable will cause massive new taxes and inflation. That's not true. Higher taxes may be needed, but on whom? So following the tax cuts job um, for the last, time, last uh, 100 years, billionaires paid less than the rest of the population. Steel workers, school teachers, you, me. And then we know Amazon made 11.2 billion, didn't pay federal taxes, and got a 127 million refund. And there's another a whole list of 12 of them, all of them we recognize that also didn't pay federal taxes. Like Facebook and Uber and all these big companies not paying any taxes. Mm -hmm. So there's another place where we get money. So when they pay their fair share, see everyone benefits. Single payer Medicare for all is socialized medicine. This was started way back after the war when everybody was afraid of Russia and communism and socialized. Everything was, oh, that's going to be socialized medicine. And that's how they used to fight it back then. But somehow that got stuck in our heads because socialized medicine isn't what we're talking about. Socialized medicine is a system where doctors are employed by the government and hospitals are owned by the government. Well, that's not what we're doing. Remember that's we said like earlier? VA. That's yeah. A VA system. Yeah, VA is um, a socialized system. The old, you know those 19 other, those 18 other countries I was talking about? The UK, out of all those countries, is the only other country they do have socialized medicine. They're the only one. All the other countries, France, Canada, Switzerland, Australia, all of them, they've figured out how to do single payer. They all do it differently. It's mind boggling, but they've all figured out different ways based on their values. They all have single payer. They all take care of all their own people, and they all do it based on that country's and those people's values. Oh, yeah. Delivery of cares remains private, even though the financing is public. And providers and patients make the decisions about care. I keep going over that one because that, that one is <laughs> so important that you and the physician make the decision about your care. Doctors will never buy into single payer because it will decrease their salaries. And we had like breaking news this morning. It was so exciting. I made a copy of it because I didn't want to get anything wrong. Okay. The tide is turning within the medical profession when it comes to Medicare for All. Yesterday, the American College of Physicians released a new position paper endorsing single payer as a solution to our nation's inefficient, unaffordable, unsustainable, and inaccessible healthcare system. And today, an open letter organized by Physicians for a National Health Care Plan, another huge organization, was signed by more than 2,000 physicians. And if you open the Times on page A7, it's all the names of all of them, it can be all of them, but it's just filled with all the doctors. And many, many doctors, signatories of the letter include towering figures in American medicine. So it, it's just really, really, really exciting. Um, and another uh, de development was um, when Partnership for America's Healthcare Future was started. It was started by an insurance company man. And he went to the AMA, because the AMA has always been on the side of let's not do, let's not do anything about this um, health care for all, universal health care. But because there are so many young doctors coming into the system now, the AMA 
was forced to pull out of that dark money group. So the AMA no longer uh, is, is within that partnership for America's healthcare future. So the young doctors coming up are saying, no, we're studying to be able to take care of our patients, not go through administration, fight with insurance companies, be frustrated at the end of the day. And so um, over 50% over of doctors are now on board for single payer Medicare for all because they can see what good it'll do for them and for their, especially for their patients. Each of those doctors spends, this is just another um, um, way that doctors aren't going to lose money. Each US doctor spends nearly 83,000 a year on administration costs. But a Canadian doctor spends 20, uh, 22,230 under the single payer system. So there's, there's a savings. So see, they're saving money. They don't have, they're, there's a crisis among the doctors too because they're getting so overwhelmed and frustrated that um, they can't do their jobs. They can't do what they wanted to do. They're stuck in this system that the insurance companies have, have created for us. Um, given the opportunity to practice high quality medicine in a low stress environment, more than half of the physicians now embrace the idea of single payer system as the best outcome for future payment reform. Any reduction in revenues that results from a shift to Medicare level payments would be more than offset by savings and job satisfaction, benefits that would accrue from being free of administrative burdens and costs. That's Dr. Milton um, Packer, American cardiologist. Um, he says it so much better than I just did. <laughs> and I just love this cartoon because here's the insurance companies. We could even say that's the healthcare system. And in exchange, you say, we can't afford healthcare reform. And he's talking to the Congress over here as he's pushing the lobbying money over. So it's legalized bribery, but you know what? It's not, it's on both sides. It's nonpartisan. They spent $3.4 billion on lobbying and a whopping $709 million on campaign contributions um, over the 2006-2012 when ACA was being worked on. And here's the guys that are going to stop it too. <laughs> this is the other savings. David doesn't want to learn his, lose his $58.8 million a year. And Mark 58 and Joseph 26. And this is just the insurance companies. This isn't the pharma, this isn't the hospitals, and this isn't the next level down underneath them or all the other insurance companies. So the amount of savings by having a single payer system. And it's hard, what, what's 83 million? I mean, that, I can't even grasp what that is. But if you look at it per day, this guy's making 220, well, you might as well say $228,000 a day. Could your healthcare dollars go for something better like healthcare than these CEO salaries? So to summarize, we do, we do have a choice. When they say we don't have a choice, we do. We do have a choice. Even though the, uh, the for-profit health insurance company is telling us we don't, it's in their best interest to tell us you don't have a choice because they don't want to lose all of this um, profits they've built over the years. So we're already paying for it, so there's only one question. Do you want to give the health care dollars to insurance company CEOs, shareholders, bureaucracy, political donations, lobbying, TV ads, profit, etc. Or do we want our health care dollars to go for health care for you, your family, and for everyone? So uh, Dr. Adams um, is the president of the national, no, Dr. he's just with the organization. Passing a Medicare for all system would buy our patients freedom. People would be out in the street demanding it if they really knew if they really knew and didn't have bombarded with all these myths all the time that made them go, hmm, put that fear in their head. And then Dr. Gaffney is the president of the uh, Physicians for National Healthcare Plan because he says it so well. He says, accept no substitutes, only single payer Medicare for all can fix the grave dysfunctions and injustices of the American healthcare system. Congress shouldn't be distracted with incremental plans like a Medicare
Medicare buy-in or a public option. The only way to achieve universal and comprehensive coverage is to eliminate the profits and the waste to the private insurance industry, which drains hundreds of billions of dollars from our healthcare system each year. So if we can end slavery, we can get women the right to vote. How hard was that? The men didn't want it. The South, Southern women didn't want it, but they worked for, they worked for what, 70, 80 years and they got women to vote. Okay, they can put men, on, men and women on the moon, and all the other countries have done it for less with better outcomes. We should be able to do it. Comprehensive, cost-effective, single-payer, improved and expanded healthcare for all. So what can we do? We can share the facts with our friend and our family. I'll give anybody this information, and we had, Carol and I put together um, a comparison sheet that we tell you between all of the plans we put together a trifold with all the myths and the answers and the questions. We can host a house party and show one of the great documentaries we've, we've given you links to, which are in that folder. The gentleman I told you that had the company that had 200 employees, that international company, he was so upset by what it was doing to his company and seeing a lot of his cohorts going out of business that he put together some documentaries. on uh, one called, it's called, One's called Fix It, One's about the Canadian um, healthcare system, um, one's about pharma, and they're short and they're fascinating. Invite us to give a presentation to another group which you belong to. And you can help by educating and advocating, and if not who, we can't belong <laughs> you. <laughs> so if we have healthy people, we have a healthy democracy, and we have a healthy country. So thank you very much, everybody. So she mentioned that we have some resources there. So we have a trifold that gives you an, an overview of what Medicare for All is, what the problem is, what the solution is. And on the back, she was talking the doc, about the documentaries. You can see them online. We also have a lending library of DVDs. But if you have a computer, you can just watch them right online. And a comparison sheet, because everybody's wondering, what. What, are, what is the difference between Medicare for all, single payer, and the other options that the presidential candidates are advocating for? So um, we would be glad to share that with you. We also have a book on all the questions, all the myths that are out there and what the facts are for that. So we've tried to put together some resources. We're reading this stuff every day. There's really fascinating articles every day, but the average person doesn't have time to read all this stuff, so we've tried to narrow it down so it would be easier for you. And I know that the brochures, the rules for brochures is that you have lots of white space. As you will see, there's no white space. So we opted for information versus the white space. Thank you very much. I know I went through it so very, very fast. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Do I? I, I said, I think you should join Elizabeth Warren's campaign. Oh, you think so? But yes, I do think so. <laughs> because I've been interested in this for over 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm on Medicare, it's not as important to me because I am getting it. Uh, I think it's going to affect the older people because we are not paying anything for it now, and we will probably pay for it. But I think it's a wonderful thing. When we were in Canada, years ago we took a cruise through Canada and we had a taxi driver who took us all around and we started talking about this system that they had there and I said to him you know I said people say that they can't get they have to have an operation they have to have this and they can't get it because there are so many people mm -hmm. with this doctor that you just don't walk in and tomorrow you have your um, right. operation. So he said, well, you know, he said, that's true. If you have a, a, a problem that you can wait two months, three months, you do wait two months, three months, because they don't have the doctors to do it. However, he says, if it's an emergency, then you get it right away. That's what I've been saying. Exactly. If you have an emergency, you can be in there the next day. Exactly. But if you can wait, they do make you wait. 
And so, another thing about the presentation that, that I didn't bring up, because um, you can't bring up everything, is wait times. We have a lot of wait times in the United States. Yeah. Not a lot of stories about that, too. Did anybody else have any questions? With Medicare for all, you wouldn't have to pay. You wouldn't have supplemental insurance. You and wouldn't everybody, pay for Medicare. Everybody, everybody will have it. Right. So it's not going to cost so you more money. Good, you said where the government's going to get the money. Uh, but with with all the people that are putting wrenches and raising billions to find it, it's not that easy. It's not easy at all. And one of the reasons it's not that easy is the lobbyists own Congress. Yes. Right. So as long as the people who are in office will be tempted not to vote for it, it's never going to happen. It's, it, it's not that's easy as people think. It's the only problem I have is our grandchildren's generation will vote them out. Well, that's why Carol and I feel so passionate about, about not giving up, because if we just gave up, we'd be one of those people that just said, well, you know, it's too hard. So we want to keep working for it, sort of like the gals that were trying to get the vote. They were put in prison and force fed and you know, but they said, you know what, women are gonna get this vote and we're gonna keep working for it until more and more and more and more women finally said we want the vote. Um, over these over these years, like that's what I was saying at the beginning, now is the time because people are so so many people are hurt by this, so many bankrupt families, so many people, my sister, her 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 retirement is gone, and now she still isn't well. They never found out what was wrong. So what will happen next? So it's scary for family. It's scary for, she's worked all her life seven days a week building a business, and now what's her retirement going to be for? Because she got, so, so it's, it's hurting so many families. I think people have finally gotten together and said, we want this. And if enough people say we want it and enough people fight it, that's why. Um, 
Partnership for America's Healthcare Future band together because they, they're scared. They saw how many people want it, so they're putting out all these fear-based things. But if Carolyn and I can give enough presentations and enough people that are in our audiences can start telling their their friends and their family, you can't believe what Linda Carroll just told me. That's why we say, too, and I'm sorry I didn't say it, vote for people who believe in what, who, who aren't taking money. It's another list, Carol and I have, we've got so much. <laughs> another list of the hundreds of thousands of dollars our Democratic people are taking from insurance companies. And the ones that are taking the money are the ones that are vying for, oh, let's have a buy-in. Let's, uh, let's expand the ACA, because the insurance companies aren't taken out of that picture. So. If you look at that list and see all the people, all of the candidates that are taking money, that's why it's so important. That's why a candidate is constantly saying, guess what, I don't take back money. They want you to know that they aren't indebted. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.